It's episode 12 of Bandits Weekly presented by Smash Supplements. My name is Nathan Crosby. Bandits rolling through the month of November, a perfect 11-0 record, and they open up December with three straight wins, two over the Saints on home ice, and then shutting out the Dragons in Drumheller. Lots to discuss on the podcast, plus we have a terrific guest this week, Bandits alumni Arno Vashon. He played three seasons in Brooks, won two AJ championships, a national championship, played in two national championship tournaments, then had a great career at Colgate, and now is playing in his fifth year of college hockey at Augustana. We'll catch up with Vash in just a few minutes, but let's recap what's happening with the Brooks Bandits. Remember, they had that game in Siksika a week ago against the Calgary Canucks, which they won 6-1 to wrap up a perfect November. Then, back-to-back -back home games against the Spruce Grove Saints at the CRA. The Saints played the Bandits very tough in the two previous meetings up in Spruce Grove earlier this year. One of those games went to overtime, which Luke Marshall ended. And wouldn't you know it, they go back to overtime in the first of the two meetings this past weekend at the CRA. And it's Mirko Budazoni with the overtime winning goal. Parker Lalonde credited with the nice assist on the faceoff win. Uh, that goal came 40 seconds into OT. That was a hard-fought game. The Bandits were trailing 2-0 in that game until a Davide Patella goal late in the first period cued uh, the comeback. That was also the debut of newcomer Nick Peluso, who just signed with the team. He started the year in the USHL with Tri-City. His Bandit debut was pretty nice, a goal and an assist. And as he told us on the broadcast, he had about 17 hours of driving to get here from the States. So it looks pretty good uh, in his Bandit debut and a 5-4 win over the Saints so the Bandits and Saints what a rivalry this has been you know three straight league finals six total AJ finals between the Bandits and Saints head-to-head -head. and four of the last six meetings between the team including the playoffs last year have gone to overtime and so we had another one on Friday with Budazoni winning it then on Saturday that was the rematch and of course it was a big game here at the CRA it was the teddy bear night huge crowd uh, for the teddy bear goal, which was scored by Kalen Fitzpatrick. Uh, we had 1,013 teddy bears this year, which is uh, a new record for the team. 913 was the previous record, so we beat it by a, uh, 100 teddy bears. Big thank you to our fans uh, for coming out and supporting the event and all those donations that will go to the Scotiabank Smiles for Christmas campaign. Thanks to the Rosemary hockey team as well, who helped clean up the bears on the ice. As for the game, it was an intense game, lots of penalties, um, and it just the feeling in the building certainly was everyone was pretty fired up about the game. And it was 4-4 heading uh, in late into the second before the Bandits were able to take the lead on a Logan Sawyer goal. He ends up scoring two that night, and the Bandits win the game 7-4. Spruce Grove, it's pretty baffling where they are in the standings considering how tough they played the Bandits, and I think you'll start to see that Saint team start to rise up the standings uh, eventually. So the Bandits win both games over Spruce Grove. That led into Tuesday night's game, which was the first of four straight road games for the Bandits. It was our first trip to Drumheller of the season, and the Bandits just have completely stifled the Dragons this year. Drum has scored one goal against Brooks in three games. Johnny Hicks picks up the shutout with 19 saves in a 7-0 win. The Bandits have outscored Drum 16-1 through three games this year into their season series. And there was also two team records set that night. Bandits set a team record for shorthanded goals scored in a season. And it's only early December and they've done this already as they have now scored 13 shorties this year. The previous record was 12 shorthanded goals by the 2015-16 team. The other record they set that night was two fastest shorthanded goals. Uh, Huey Hooker scored a shorty in the third period off the rush, and then 11 seconds later, Parker Lalonde scored a shorty on the same kill on a breakaway. So those are the two fastest shorthanded goals in Brooks Bandits history. In AJ history, it's tied for the fourth fastest. Um, the, the record in the league is five seconds, by the way. Bandits win 7-0 over the Dragons. Brooks now on a 14-game winning streak, heading into what will be a tough stretch here as the World Junior A Challenge is starting in Nova Scotia. Six Brooks Bandits are on Team Canada. Logan Sawyer, Nathan Free, Ty Mason, Dylan Compton, Matthew Tyfair, and goaltender Johnny Hicks. So the Bandits have five games before Christmas. Looking forward to seeing what they can do. Our episode is brought to you by Smash Supplements, where you can get everything you need to power through your day and level up 
located in downtown Brooks, open Monday to Friday, 10 to 6, and then Saturday, 10 to 4. Our guest on Bandits Weekly played three seasons for the Brooks Bandits. It saw him win two AJ championships. He played in two RBC Cups, won the National Junior A Championship in this arena in his final game. Went on to have four seasons at Colgate where he won an ECAC championship last year. He's now a fifth year player with the newest NCAA Division I school, Augustana in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Our guest is Arno Vashon. Our guest on Bandits Weekly is Arno Vashon. It's great to see you, my friend. It's been a few years, uh, but uh, you look great. It's great to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, lots to catch up on with uh, yourself, uh, but uh, first off, uh, you're out there with Augustana in uh, South Dakota, brand new NCAA Division I school, um, you know, your fifth year. I mean, what an experience for you it must be to be uh, to be transferring there and uh, and playing for a new program like that. Yeah, yeah. The, the new program is where it's really interesting and it's fun. Um, we're like the the new kids on the block kind of in, in the community. Everyone's hyped for us. Uh, uh, for the, being the first season. It's been really fun so far growing with uh, the team, setting a new culture, especially with the new team. I've been seeing some videos. It looks like great atmosphere um, in that arena where the USHL team plays. And uh, we were just talking before the interview, you guys will be moving in soon to your brand new arena that they're, they're building there. Uh, looks like a pretty legit place. Uh, um, that must be pretty exciting. And so it's going to be like a mid season move. Like you're going to have your home opener, like after Christmas. Yeah, yeah. In January, we have our home opener against uh, Ferris, and um, we're going to be playing uh, ex-Bandits, uh, Nick Hale. It'll be fun. Um, but yeah, the Midco, it's uh, it's being built right now. It's, uh, it's actually across the street from where I live, and it's fun to see the, them taking new steps every day with uh, opening up pretty soon. But um, the new the rink at the Denny Sanford, it was fun too for the home opener against Bowling Green. Got a lot of fans out there, and it, it was fun to see the, the excitement from the community and the school. Well, not only that, I saw your goal uh, tweeted out there. That's pretty sweet. The game-winning goal, um, the the first ever uh, game-winning goal for Augustana there against Bowling Green. And you and did you still, did you, get, did you get to keep the puck from that? What was that moment like? Uh, no, I think I only give out the pucks. The guys, uh, first year guys, I guess fifth years guys don't get pucks very often. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was cool getting the game-winning goal. I probably got the luckiest bounce in, in hockey off the boards there and came right to my stick. But um, I'll take them. Right on. I mean, I look at like the where you were for four years in New York with Colgate and then transferring to South Dakota to Sioux Falls. What a transition. Has it, is it been um, a smooth transition? What's that been like for you? Yeah. I mean, once uh, that year finished at Colgate, I, I entered the portal. Um, an ex head uh, assistant coach at Colgate was a uh, assistant coach here at Augustana and he reached out to me and then I got, in contact with the head coach, uh, Garrett Rabwine. And I mean, we built a relationship and they kind of sold me on the the new program here and moving here has been fun. I mean, I never expected ever to be in South Dakota, but uh, it's been a fun move and the guys are great here. Really cool to see division one hockey in South Dakota. And that, that conference is becoming really good. And a lot of former bandits in the CCHA as well, which is, which is really awesome. Um, and so getting to, to, ex be there for the beginning of this thing what's that like yeah it's unique because usually like when i was at colgate every year we have a, a new class of freshmen coming in mm -hmm. but here basically we're all freshmen we're all, we're all new guys even though that we have a couple of fifth years here we we have experience but everyone's new we get to meet each other for the first time and then it's a quick turnaround two months later where you're playing your first game together but uh the guys are gelling well and it's been fun so far and uh i have no complaints and I've never been to, to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I've driven through South Dakota. I mean, some similarities to Southern Alberta. And I mean, uh, Sioux Falls is a bit bigger than Brooks, but do you think maybe playing in Brooks and out here uh, away from home, maybe it would help you prepare for a plane in a place like Sioux Falls? Yeah. I mean, the drive from uh, Minnesota down to Sioux Falls was very similar from Calgary to <laughs> it kind of feels like you're driving a circle with the, the flat land and the farmland and stuff, but uh, yeah, the it's a it's it's a big city, but still a small community feel. Uh, kind of like Brooks, when you go out to, I mean, for example, going to Subway, we have a a fan that would talk to us for five minutes and be excited, which is the same thing in Brooks. You you go out and people are excited to see your next game. So yeah, I would say that the transition helped a lot being in Brooks for three years. 
Yeah, uh, going back now in, in your history, you play at the Hill Academy prior to coming uh, to the Brooks Bandits. What was that experience like? That was, that was unreal too. I mean, um, I was juggling between staying in minor hockey in, in my hometown or going to play prep school in, in Toronto. And I mean, that was, that was a strategic move, I guess, on our part because that ultimately brought me to Brooks and uh, the exposure of playing in the States a lot with the, with the prep team. And then uh, Paps called me and I was lucky enough to get a spot in the Brooks Bandits. Yeah, and what a run you had with the Brooks Bandits in your three seasons here. You get to play in two RBC Cups, including the one that we hosted in 2019. You win two AJ championships. And then, of course, that that final your final game was a Brooks Bandit. What a way to go out. I've talked to you about that. Uh, Nathan Plessy, you know, other guys that where they, they finished their bandit career winning the national championship on home ice. I mean, it was quite the run for you here in Brooks. So when you look back on it now, what, just tell me about what are some of the th- memories you have about playing in Brooks? I mean, the memories you, you said it, although the championships we won and the relationships built with guys throughout the three years, um, we still stay in contact with, with a bunch of guys. Um, it really shows how close we were as a team. Um, but like you said, finishing it off, uh, winning it at home, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. That last countdown from 10 seconds, just hearing the crowd, it, it was nuts. And it was great having family there, friends, and just winning it at home with the fans. That was, that was something I'll never forget. I, that playoff was uh, intense. There was some series, like there was so much pressure on you guys to do well that year. And obviously you did in the regular season, 57 and three in that uh, year we hosted the national championship, but there was so much pressure on this team uh, hosting the event to, to win it all. And the playoffs, you know, there was some moments there. One of the the moments of that playoff run that I'll always remember has to do with you. And that is uh, the game in Canmore with the uh, completing the hat trick uh, in overtime and uh, walking off the ice. We've seen other bandits since then. Jeff Malott did it in the American league. Uh, I got to ask about this, this walking off the ice thing. Like, where did that come from? Was that just pure reactionary? Yeah, I forget who did it at the time. It was in the NHL, though. It might have been Corey Perry. I'm not sure who it was, but they scored and they walked off. And I remember going to overtime in Camor, all the guys were, were in the room, and we felt positive about the game. I mean, we were dominating the entire time. So kind of cocky. We were talking about our celebration, saying what we're going to do, whoever scores. And I remember uh, someone said, whoever scores, I just need to do the walk-off. And the second I tapped that one in from the, the slot, I, the immediate thing I thought was get to the door. I was kind of scared. I was scared the door wasn't going to open, but but uh, it, it was funny and it was, it was fun to do that with the guys. Well, and of all the arenas in the AJ, Cadmore has the the visiting team skates off between the crowd, like it's unique that way. So you walk through the crowd off the ice. It was one of those. It was like a stunning moment, and like in the back of my mind, I'm like, this is hilarious, but it was also awesome. And remember, like Canmore won the night before, so that was an important game. I mean, that must have been a ton of emotion uh, that uh, you know you had that night with that game. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing playing with Brooks, and that's kind of translated through how I act after games. I mean, hockey's not an easy sport to win every game, but. Um, you got to regroup the next day. And I think that's what made us so successful in Brooks is that even if we lost, we we learned from it and then we moved on. And that's what happened in Canmar. We, we, we lost that one game, but then came back the next game. We knew we, we could beat them if we played uh, our game. And that's what we did. And it went on and it all worked out winning on home ice. Uh, that 2018-19 team um, and next spring, by the way, we'll be celebrating the five-year anniversary of you guys winning the national championship in Brooks. But I always, you know, now that I've been around the bandits for all, all these years, I, you know, every year I, I look at each team differently, differently. And like, what was, you know, the, the, the strengths of each team and what made each team unique. I look at that 2018, 19 team as one uh, cohesive unit, four lines, everyone did their part. Uh, how would you describe that team? Yeah. Everyone always asks like, what do you think our best team was when my three years there? And obviously my first thing that I think about is my first year just because Kale McCarr was on the team. I mean, <laughs> I'd sit on the bench and I'd be like, how are we going to lose now? We have Kale McCarr on the point. But um, I think that last year that I was there, the 2018, 2019 team, like you said, we were such a close team. We had four lines that we could roll every single game and we, we held each other accountable. I mean, practice or in games, the practice was probably way harder than games. And I think that's what translated to us winning the championship. It was it was a team that that knew what we wanted and we were focused to getting it. That 2016-17 team was nasty too, though. Oh, oh my yeah. god. 
they rolled through uh, Alberta and the uh, AJ playoffs. Um, yeah, that was a, a tremendous team as well. Uh, I got to ask you about Jake Tice, who also uh, – now, I'm pretty sure Jake was here the same amount of time that you were in, in Brooks all three years, and you guys obviously became great friends. You were uh, billeting in the same place. Uh, just tell us about your relationship with uh, with Jake. Yeah, it's funny because me and Jake always talk about it. We had a camp the summer prior to going to Brooks, and I, I think we kind of like recognize each other in the locker room. We we're kind of like looking like, I think I've seen you somewhere. And then we end up being in the same house with the Josh and Tia, our billets, which again, those people were the, the greatest billets out there. Um, but yeah, me and Jake became really close friends, uh, best friends. Actually, we still talk to this day and we hang out in the summers. But uh, yeah, I was thankful to have someone that I could spend the three years with and be so close with. And, and what's Jake up to right now? He was at Stevens Point there. Do uh, you know what he's up to these days? Yeah, now he's working uh, full time. Now he's a full time worker in, in Wisconsin. Oh, we'll have to, we'll have to maybe get him on the pod one day here. And uh, yeah. I always really enjoyed uh, when you two were together. It seemed like it's such a tight knit group. And ever since then, when we have players that you can tell become friends, I'm like, oh, this is this year's Arno and Jake. Yeah, well, people would always laugh at us. Like, you guys are always together. Like, do you guys, you guys are inseparable. But I was like, we live together. We have one. <laughs> like, what do you want to do? Like, one guy walks and one guy drives. But, but yeah, it, it was fun living with them. We had the same sense of humor. Just. I mean, at one point, me and Jake had like a prank war with Paps and and Scott Cunningham at the time. And I mean, those kind of things, is it, it's fun during the year and it, it keeps it light and, and fun. One last thing on the Bandits, uh, just up your time here. Um, what do you think playing for the Brooks Bandits helped you, not just as a hockey player, but uh, as a person as well, develop? Yeah, I think the way that, that Pap runs a program, it's a very NCAA oriented program, just in the way we do practice in the morning and then video and it's very organized and just the way you play it's very systematic um and just translating that to to college I mean it, it was not an easy transition I could say because the college game it's a little faster and they close on you quick mm. but all those little, little details that I learned in Brooks um that Pap taught us it, it just translates so well where I could have success um without the puck or with the puck and and yeah it helped a lot now <laughs> in my fifth year so it's still going good I guess and then just off the ice too, that whole uh, being disciplined, details of discipline, working hard. How did that help you off the ice? Yeah, the whole discipline part and even being integrated into the community. I guess in college, you don't have that much more free time to, to do all that community work, but it, it helps you a lot to be a good person on campus and just the way that you you behave in classrooms and just respect towards the professors and just people around you. It, it, that all stemmed from how Pat wanted us to, to act off the ice. So you leave Brooks uh, and then you go to Colgate and uh, four seasons uh, with Colgate last year, you guys win the ECAC championship. Uh, I remember um, the, it was the semifinal. You guys won in overtime, I believe over uh, Quinnipiac. And then you win the, the championship uh, in that conference. Just tell me about uh, last season and, and finishing at Colgate on such a high note like that. Yeah. Colgate, they, they always say that uh, college is the best four years of your life and I thought that would be hard to beat after Brooks. I mean, Brooks was still a great, great part of my life, but Colgate is something I'll never forget the experience I made there and the friendships. Uh, and especially that last year, um, it reminded me a lot of that 2018 team that we had, how close we were um, mm -hmm. being in the leadership group at that time. That's one thing that we talked a lot about and getting the guys close together, just off the ice, on the ice is being a cohesive unit. And that paid out at the end, I think against Harvard, we had like 40 or 50 something block shots. Guys were sacrificing their body for the guys. And it was, it, it was a it was a fun time getting to celebrate. All those guys were so emotional when we were lifting the cup and hugging after after that championship win. That's just because we know how much work and dedication to put in in those four years to finally get to that point. And how do you think you really benefited from not just playing at Colgate and playing for Brooks, but just playing uh, the college hockey, uh, going the, the college hockey route? Yeah, like I said before, it's just like that. You grow as a as an athlete, but also as a person, you learn to how to act off the ice, just time management wise. Um, you have classes that you have to take care of. You have workouts and then you have skating and then you have games on top of that. You don't get many breaks like regular students do, but, but it's a fun time, especially when the, the team is close. And, and yeah, that's one thing at Colgate that, that I enjoyed and it, it taught me a lot. Um, it's a great school too. Uh, so 
getting a degree from there won't hurt in the, in the future once I need to enter the corporate world. But I'm really happy with my four years there. Yeah, I was reading your your bio there on the Augustana page. So you're finishing your MBA, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And so what's the uh obviously see where hockey takes you, but uh then what? Yeah, that's that's the the big talk being the fifth year now. It's uh it's the then what question. Obviously, I want to see how far hockey can take me, like you said. Um, that'll be in the talk soon with the the season's already halfway done, which is crazy. It's flying by. Mm. Um, but yeah, hopefully play hockey and the pros as long as I can, as long as my body could, could hold it. And then, uh, join the corporate world. I don't know, maybe do some environmental consulting. We'll see. It's like, I don't know. Everyone always asks me what I want to do. It's, I don't really know. <laughs> hey, when I, when it was same thing when I was your age and, uh, you, you'll figure it out. And, uh, I'm sure you got a very bright future ahead of you. Uh, finally, I just want to ask about your family. I know I got to know your dad a little bit. Um, when uh, you were playing in Brooks, great guy, uh, and your the rest of your family, how's everyone doing? They're good. They're they're still very supportive. Um, my dad, my dad's the same old, very outgoing guy. He he's not scared to get any chant going. If I'm go bandits to go Raiders now, go Vikings. Um, he'll be out here probably in the second half of the, the season. But yeah, family's good. They're also supporting me, so I'm thankful for that. Hey, if your dad wants to make a trip to Brooks, uh, I know uh myself, Ken Flurry, uh, we will uh welcome him in welcome him in. He can join us on the broadcast. He can talk you up and uh, he's just such a personality. So we miss all of you here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you talk about me and Jake's relationship. I think uh, I heard a story of him and Jack, uh, Jake's dad going on the ice between periods doing that, getting dressed and they did me and Jake's like handshake after. So, I mean, you got, if you get him on the podcast and you got to ask him about his relationship with Jack is not very, it's very similar to me and Jake's. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I remember I remember uh, something about them uh, doing one of the intermission games and they're always good sports about that and uh, always really like meeting the parents of the players, especially ones that really, uh, you know, can have fun with it. And uh, that's always appreciated. And your dad certainly uh, was always a great time around here. So we miss him. We miss you. And uh, it was great catching up with you, Arno. Uh, it's fantastic season you're having at Augustan and really cool that you get to be a part of that. Um, and, and help that uh, get off the ground after uh, quite the career in Brooks and Colgate. We wish you nothing but the best uh, moving forward here. Thank you. And thanks for having me on the podcast. Appreciate it. Big thanks to Arno Vashon for joining us on Bandits Weekly and good luck to him the rest of this season at Augustana. Wrapping up this week's episode, big congratulations to forward Logan Sawyer, who's now won the AJHL Rookie of the Ye Rookie of the Week Award four times this year and three in a row. Probably won't get it uh, this week because he's off to Nova Scotia and will miss the next five games uh, along with five of his teammates. But uh, congratulations to Sawyer on his fourth Rookie of the Week award. He's running away with the, the rookie scoring race right now in the AJ. Yes, the World Junior A Challenge begins on December 10th. Canada West will face Sweden at 3.30 Atlantic time, so 12.30 Brooks time on Sunday. Uh, the games will be available on uh, Hockey Canada's website. Uh, the championship will be on TSN. Uh, Canada will play Sweden, Canada East, Slovakia, and then they wrap up the round robin uh, against the United States. Uh, so hopefully Canada West can have uh, a better showing. They've had some tough tournaments at the World Junior A Challenge as of late. So hopefully um, a great tournament here for our six bandits and Canada West. Lots of AJ players on that Canada West team. Uh, Bandits making up the biggest chunk of that with six of them. And then as for the Brooks Bandits back here, it's business as usual, but five games before the Christmas break. Three straight on the road to start this, um, this period without these players. We're in Okotoks on Friday. We're in Cam Rose on Saturday. And Can Moore next Tuesday before wrapping up with back-to-back -back home games against the Kodiaks and Bulldogs. Looking forward to that Friday night game in Okotoks. It's our last trip of the season uh, to Okotoks. It's always tough to play there. Oilers will be missing three of their key players that will be heading off to the World Junior A Challenge as well. Bandits are 2-0 and this season against the Oilers, including that game at the Showcase in Calgary back in, in September. And then Camrose, uh, that'll be our final trip to, to the Encana Arena of the season. Bandits dropped one of their only three losses this year was in uh, Camrose back at the beginning of the year. So Looking for some redemption on Saturday. Looking forward to the stretch here before the Christmas break, which will be well-earned by the Brooks Bandits, but obviously uh, job not done before they head home. Five 
games coming up, Bandits in first in the AJHL, and looking to keep rolling. That's going to do it for this week's episode of Bandits Weekly. Big thank you to Arno Vachon and our media coordinator, Drayson Kuyper. I'm Nathan Crosby.